Hello, this is Kerry Schutz, and this is our second video on this two transistor oscillator circuit built up using Simscape Electrical. In the first video, we showed what the circuit looked like and we went over how it worked. Um, and we covered how it worked by uh, covering the uh, charge and discharge cycles and how when the transistors turn on and when they turn off. And basically, that's all controlled by um, this R1 C1. Uh, resistor capacitor combination. So initially, we're turning the transistors on and charging up C1 from right to left. Uh, then uh, once it charges up fully, we essentially starve Q1 of current. We turn off the transistors and then uh, we start charging up C1 in the other direction from left to right until this voltage across Q1 reaches a certain threshold voltage again and we turn the transistors on again and the cycle repeats uh, on and on, or on and off, I should say, forever. And then we uh, jumped into uh, an actual demonstration of the circuit, again, using Simulink and Simscape Electrical. Uh, we looked at the voltage across R2, which we're calling our load resistor, and we saw it was a pulse train with a particular frequency of around 1.367 kilohertz and a very, very small duty cycle of uh, a fraction of a percent, about 0.036% here. And we also saw in that video how we could change that duty cycle on off time and we could change that frequency by changing R1 and C1 uh, values. Now, in this video, what we want to do is take a, a look at how we would do more in-depth uh, analysis or debugging of the circuit, in particular, how we could probe uh, or look at certain current and voltages at different nodes of the circuit. Although this is a simple circuit, you can immediately see that there's lots of currents and voltages. Uh, you've got, you know, a current here, a current here, a current here, uh, a current here, a current through here, a current through here, uh, a current through here, etc. And you've got voltages at all these nodes. And you've got voltages at the nodes, and you've also got voltages across the components or with respect to different nodes. So the number of voltage combinations and currents you could look at would, um, it, it gets pretty large pretty fast. And to, uh, shall we say, probe those um, currents and voltages using this technique where we inserted a voltage sensor and a, P a physical signal to simulate converter would get rather tedious if we had to step and repeat this process everywhere throughout the model for every node that we were um, interested in probing. You know, I'll just say if we want to look at the base voltage, we could do this, put another scope up here, you know rename it, you know, whatever, something else, and continue that process. You imagine doing that over and over again. And it gets even more tedious if we were to try to look at currents, because there that forces us to break a wire, insert a current sensor with the right orientation. Maybe we want it going uh, from the base of Q2 to the collector of Q1. We got to wire all that up, insert another physical signal to simulate converter, insert another scope. And it gets, you know, really hairy, really tedious. So we're going to, we want to avoid all that in this recording and look at a, hopefully a different and better way. And that different and better way involves using the Simulink Data Inspector. There's a uh, shortcut for it right here. If I were to click on that, it will open up Simulink Data Inspector. Um, there's other ways to open it. You can open it up programmatically. You can just type simulink.sdi.view and call it and it'll do the exact same thing if you want to open it up programmatically. Um, and there's also the Simulink logging uh, signal, which you can put on any Simulink signal. And there you can either start or stop logging the selected signal. Once you have that Wi-Fi type uh, logging signal, you can double click on that signal at any time and pull up the Simulink data inspector that way as well. So many ways to open that up. Now, before we run the model, we want to make sure the model is configured properly for logging Simscape signals or sim, yeah, currents and voltages. So I'm going to call up the model settings, clicking on the gear icon. And the most important setting is under here under Simscape on the left. And you want to make sure to check off or check, I should say on probably, put a check in the record data and simulate data inspector checkbox. And if you're interested in logging everything as I am, I, I want the transient, not just the last. 5,000 points, you probably want to uncheck this because I think it is at least checked by default in the 
version that I'm running, which is 22B. Um, other than that, there is one more setting you might want to set, which is under data import export. Uh, I tend to use one single simulation output. I, and it's called the out by default, which I usually just leave it at that. Uh, your simulate logging, if you're logging simulate signals, will be called logs out. That'll be a sub data structure under out. And then your simscape signals will be under the sim log, but it'll all be under one central uh, variable called out. Okay, so I'm going to run this model, or I actually already have run it, but I'll run it again. And okay, it's done. I'm going to double click on the logging signal, open up the data inspector. And we see a purple waveform for VR2, which is again, this is the Simulink unidirectionally logged voltage across our load resistor R2. If we're not, if we don't want to look at it in the Simulink domain, we can also grab it in the Simscape domain. I'm going to uh, drill down into Simulink. I'm going to go to R2, go to the resistor, and save, click on V. And now we got the same waveform, just kind of just in green. We could, of course, change that to a different color. I'll change it to blue, let's say, set. And if you, of course, you know, you do want to do things like, hey, it looks maybe too thin to you, you know, we could change the line width, say, three. And now we can go in and do things like zoom in on it. In time, I'll look at the transient response across uh, that load resistor. And we can see it's on. Uh, this is the on time of Q1 where the voltage is high at this node here. Um, and it only lasts about a quarter of a microsecond. If we can even zoom in further to get really the fine details of what happens right at power up. And what we'll see is there's multiple time constants in this model. Uh, that aren't obvious from just looking at the outer circuit uh, as shown here in the Simscape or Simulink diagram. We also see there's time constants that are like on the order of like a picosecond, which are not really controlled by this 10 nanofarad capacitor, uh, but they're really controlled by the parasitics on the uh, on the transistors, like the, the base to emitter and collector to uh, base junctions. You there's uh, uh, parasitic or capacitances associated with those that I'm showing here. And you can change those values from their defaults of five picofarads. <clears throat> but in any case, uh, the voltage you know, immediately jumps up to about VCC, about five volts. There's this time constant, very, very short. It, it goes down to about 3.7 volts, and then it starts to charge back up. Again, a very, very quick time constant, you know, picosecond kind of time range. Gets up to, uh, again, about five volts, around 4.9, uh, 4.8 or nine volts stays there uh, for a while until finally a, uh, it, it turns off, the transistor turns off. Now you can't see from this picture, of course, it's not obvious why the transistor turns off. If we wanna do that, we'd have to look at a different waveform. And uh, for that, we might wanna look at the base of Q1. So let's, let's change the layout here. Let's add two, or no, we, we could overlay. Let's just, we, we can add, We'll add two axes, but I will put the base of Q1 overlaid with resistor V2 here. So let's get this voltage right here. So let's go to Q1 and let's say base. Click on voltage. And now we see what's happening on the base. Um, we can see that uh, the base of Q1 is around five volts, about the same as the, uh, you know, voltage across R2. That makes sense since C1 is about for an approximate short here at startup. And then uh, that voltage on the base starts to slowly decrease. That's not a voltage you can see decreasing uh, on R2, but it is a voltage you can see decreasing on Q1. And that's happening because C1 is charging up. And what we're gonna see is as that voltage at the base of Q1, if I zoom in Y now, gets down to around 0.7 volts, which would be the threshold or, you know, turn on voltage for Q1, that that um, transistor Q1 turns off. When it turns off, again, I zoomed out too far there, really. Let's zoom in again. Whoops, I didn't mean to do that. Let's zoom out again. I want to just zoom in um, in the time. Uh, when, let's see, wait, let's go here again. When it turns off, uh, it looks like it's relatively flatlined, 
around about minus four something volts at the base of, of Q1. So you can see the voltage is pretty extreme on the base of Q1. It jumps up to about from about full VCC almost down to minus VCC, about four and a quarter volts. So there's a huge swing here on the base of Q1 due to this uh, capacitor action here on C1. So let's see what happens on base of Q1 as time progresses. It looks like it's relatively flat, but that's because we're still we're zoomed in on the in, in the greater scheme of things. We can see as we zoom out more and more, the base of Q1 is increasing in voltage as C1 charges up in the other direction now. And when it reaches around the threshold voltage of Q1, around 0.7 volts again, Q1 turns on. Uh, that in turn lowers the base uh, of Q2 a little bit, turning it on as well, which we'll see later, and the cycle repeats. So there's a very long off time controlled by the R1C1 time constant, a very short on time controlled by the um, resistance of the Q1, Q2, and, and, and C, C1, okay? And that's, that's that very, very you know, narrow pulse we see here. So we can also look at the currents. You may be interested in the currents. Uh, for instance, what is the uh, current through, uh, let's say, C1 look like? So we'll put that on the lower uh, set of axes. So we say, where is C1? C1 is at the top here. And I'll say, what is the current through it? The current here is noted here. The convention is, the way I have the capacitor oriented, it's from right to left. So positive current is going, yeah, in that direction, right to left. And we see that initially there's this big current surge through the capacitor because it's an approximate short of around five amps. It turns off, of course, after a short time, as we charge up that capacitor, uh, the, 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 the current through that capacitor is basically down to zero, it stays down to zero until the transistor turns on again, in which case there's another surge of current through the uh, transistor up to around you know three point or whatever eight or nine amps and then it decreases with that same time constant again and that cycle just repeats over and over again all right so again we can configure this however we want it we may want to look at more and more waveforms if we wanted let's say a three by one we wanted three plots uh, up and down one across we could do three rows one column uh, not 11 here let's just say one and now we've got another uh, plot down here. We would look at things like, for instance, we could look at the base of Q2, which is also the same thing as the collector of Q1. Here's Q2. Here's the base. And we could check on the voltage there. And that's what it looks like there. It goes uh, down. Well, at some point, it drops down to zero briefly as the capacitor or the transistors turn on. But then for the most part, it's kind of in the four um, maybe a four and a half range up to a little over six on that that uh, that junction here. And it turns out that that, that kind of waveform uh, largely depends on uh, the capac the uh, the uh, parasitic uh, base to emitter uh, collector base um, capacitance values. You can you can alter that waveform a lot just by changing uh, those values on the transistor. So that's kind of an interesting test you can do. Uh, that is most of what I wanted to cover in this recording. We're getting kind of long now. If you wanted to go back to what I wanted to did in the first recording, which was change the duty cycle and frequency, we could insert or modify this resistor, uh, modify the series resistance of this, um, cap this uh, C1 capacitor. We could do that, of course, on the, on the uh, component itself directly or explicitly with the separate component, insert that in there. Uh, but I'm not going to do that in this, this video. That's something left for experimentation. Um, I hope this was interesting and you learned something about using uh, Simulink Data Inspector to uh, analyze and debug your, uh, your Simscape electrical models. Thank you.